Okay, so we're here today to talk about uh, task execution schema. Um, so uh, just as by way of introduction, uh, the Global Alliance for uh, Genomics and Health has a, a cloud work stream that's working on several different APIs. Um, these include the previously mentioned uh, data repository service. There's a tool registry service. There's, you know, um, there is a workflow in execution service. And then finally, there's tax execution service, which is one I'll be talking about today. So TESS, we call it, um, is basically a, a way to issue uh, a single job request, asynchronous, um, long running batch job. So this is akin to basically the same operation that you would see in any HPC environment, uh, you know, uh, submitting a job to the cluster. Um, the key components of this is that the message packet includes a uh, mapping of all of the uh, inputs and outputs from where they exist in some external object store or data system to where they should be mapped inside the container. And then a list of all of the command lines that should be executed on these things. So in terms of specifications, it's very simple um, and um, documented uh, and uh, described in OpenAPI 3. And so this is kind of a very kind of user-friendly way to describe how to get work done. Nice thing is though, because it's kind of this, this common standard, um, it's being in, integrated into a large number of different products. So again, this is being currently used as, um, I think there was a, a a version utilized by Seven Bridges, uh, one used by the Rhodes Cromwell engine. There is a CWL engine that takes advantage of this API. And then also uh, more recently, um, there's some beta testing for uh, uh, an extension inside of SnakeMake in this next flow as well. Then that's from the, the workflow side. And then from the uh, you know, production or service side, you have a number of different uh, implementations to make this service available. So we see one from uh, uh, an implementation that was written by uh, Elixir um, over in Europe and um, called Test, and that deploys onto Kubernetes clusters. And there's an endpoint that's being packaged into Cromwell's implementation or Microsoft's implementation of Cromwell on Azure, as well as there is also a, a packed uh, uh, system called Funnel that my team worked on, which handles a whole bunch of HPC environments and some uh, uh, other systems like the AWS batch. So a lot of different, you know, both clients and servers speaking this protocol. And so obviously we want to bring uh, Galaxy in, into this, uh, this, this uh, system. And one of the exciting things about this is that not only does it enable, you know, a workflow engine or system to, uh, you know, communicate with a number of different underlying systems at the same time. It also provides the capability of actually putting in a gateway and actually federating out the requests. So that the, because the request is introspectable, you can see what the inputs and outputs are, it's a verse ID. You could say, well, this data system actually has a better location. We're going to move the job over here. So it becomes an entry point into federation for moving jobs around. And so we think that's a kind of an interesting and exciting way to kind of connect with what's going on in Galaxy. So, um, to get this actually kicked off, um, last year as part of the Google Summer of Code project, a, a student actually implemented our, our test run. Um, it's currently under a pull request um, to the main Galaxy line. So we're hoping to get this uh, kind of the, the details of this ironed out and integrated with Galaxy. Actually, the fun thing is we did uncover a couple of you know nuances in the way the Galaxy works and those. Um, uh, Issues are going to be integrated into the update to the specification. So we're currently on version 1.0. We're going to be releasing 1.1 in the near future. We'll handle some of those issues. So just by way of acknowledgement of people that are working on this, um, we have student people who uh, actually implemented the test runner. Alex, who is actually over, um, who is one of the you know, co-chairs and actually man kind of managed that project. Anya is another co-chair with the standards group that I work on and helps a lot with like building the standard app. And then we have um, these work stream leads that are kind of uh, leading this whole project, not just with tests, but also the other APIs like Durs and Wes and Hers. Thank you.
Anybody here have the Galaxy Office support here in the US? What, well, I'm sorry to catch up. Are you working to have Galaxy also support Durst and Wes? Is that in your roadmap? Well, Durst would be exactly what uh, John was talking about. In terms of Wes, I don't know if anybody's uh, working on that end of it yet. Thank you. <laughs> Model by test. So I, I provide a test and one, right? And I probably don't want everyone to submit stuff to me. So that's been rolled in slowly. Right now, it has been personal, like you roll your own endpoints, and so it's assumed that you're in your kind of security envelope. That was the 1.0 specification. GA4GH as a consortium is coming out with a larger security, uh, you know, passports and wraps specifications. So we're going to need to incorporate those components into the APIs um, uh, probably within the next couple of versions. And so at that point, you'll be able to credential yourself and say, first be allowed into the endpoint, but also we have to have a way to uh, pass credentials for like storage systems. So if you point to an S3 bucket, how do you get those S3 credentials to the executor that's actually working in the end? So the, the security and how that get passed through, those are being kind of worked on kind of Inspected right now with the added in the specification very Thank you. 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 Our next talk is on the Galaxy Storage Board by Dan and Baker. I'm also really glad to see everyone, but I'm, I'm, uh, I haven't missed this part, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm Dan, uh, I'll say right at the top, this work is primarily done by David out of the, the Freiburg group, but he said he would give me a beer if I presented it since he couldn't be here, so here we are. Um, so it, it's about the Galaxy Storage Dashboard. Um, and it's a new way to manage and visualize all of your Galaxy storage. Um, the motivation for this is if you've ever administered a Galaxy server, you've probably got hundreds, if not thousands of questions, like, you know, I, I can't possibly be using 200 gigabytes. It's not right. You know, I need to recalculate my storage. Please help me. I need more quota. It happens all the time. It's probably, I, I think Jen said, it's probably the most frequent uh, thing she has to deal with as, as a support person. Um, so, uh, what is the Galaxy Storage Dashboard? Uh, Galaxy makes it really easy to get data into Galaxy and to run a whole bunch of jobs and generate lots of data. But then how do you, how do you get rid of it, I guess, when you're done with it? Um, so the Galaxy Storage Dashboard is a centralized place to visualize and manage all of your storage in Galaxy. We want one, like a one-stop shop for seeing all of, all of your stuff and uh, performing actions on it. Um, it's yeah. So right now on, on in twenty two oh five, you can click either uh, in the top right where you have the little quota meter, or uh, it, within a history, it's right where it says how much space it's using. You can click that, and you end up at the storage dashboard. Uh, the dashboard is supposed to be sort of a. It's got so right now it's a minimal view that says you know this is your quota, this is how much storage you're using, um, and then below that uh, it gives you a couple of little wizardy things that we'll talk about in a sec. Um, the note that in the middle here, you can say refresh. This uh, sometimes Galaxy's storage calculation gets out of sync. Uh, if you've administered a Galaxy server, you probably have to deal with, yeah, please recalculate my quota. The admins have to go in, click a couple buttons, recalculate the user's quota. Um, now users can just do it themselves. So you shouldn't have to deal with as many of those requests. Um, and yeah, we, we plan to add more sort of guided assistance uh, into this in the future. Um, we also want to be able to visualize the actual sp the space you're using in uh, in a tree map, right? So you can see, oh, where where what histories are using all the space? I forgot about this stuff. So this is going to be really nice. Um, right now, when you click that button at the bottom that says "Clean Up Wizard," uh, we have these little uh, actions here that you can perform. Right 
now there are only two. Um, you can discover and free deleted data sets across your history. Something that really commonly happens is that users delete data, move on to a new history. It never got purged though, so it still counts against their quota, right? So now you can say, you know, review and clear here at the bottom, and you'll get this box on the right that says, hey, this is all stuff you've deleted. You, you can purge it if you're really done with it. Users can select all, pick individual things, click one button. It does pop up and say, are you really sure you want to delete all this stuff? <laughs> this is a safety measure. Um, and, and then it'll purge it for you. So hopefully that's much easier for users. Um, for future ideas, um, you can imagine all kinds of things you'd want. Find uh, uh, large histories, old histories, uh, intermediate files and workflow indications, uh, sort of the sky's the limit with this stuff. Anything you can query the Galaxy API for, you could build a plugin to, to be a little cleanup wizard. Um, so this is this is sort of how you'd have to add one. It's I think when, when this first rolled out, there was only the old data sets, or sorry, the, the deleted data sets plugin. Um, from a, a Jen uh, requested that we add deleted histories as well. Um, there's an example PR there that was about 80 lines of JavaScript, and we have a new feature, right? So it's it's super easy to add these extra plugins and uh, uh, sort of the sky's limit there, right? Um, yeah, so additional future features we want to be able to, you can imagine on the tree map have exposing a lot more information about the the, the date the history was last touched, you know, what, what other histories have, uh, other histories that are sharing the same data, that kind of thing. Um, we, we can add a lot of, a lot of uh, new features here. And uh, yeah, that's it. One of the things to be able to potentially say uh, using a lot of storage space, I don't want to get rid of it, but push it to some archive. So, I mean, can, can you repeat the question, please? Oh, um, so, so you're asking if you could identify identify space that's being used and push it to like cold storage, something like that, right? Yeah, or, you know, instead of primary storage, push right. it up to. Uh, I, yeah, uh, right. I mean, I imagine that's that's exactly where John's work on uh, the different user-based object stores will come in, right? So you could imagine having this all in the same interface, storage dashboard, where you see your storage and you go, okay, let's deprioritize this push it to infrequent access or whatever. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed that. Did I miss it or have the capacity to search the duplicate files? Um, it's not built in right now. I'm trying to think how you would actually do that in the API. Um, that's a great idea. Um, I don't know how. I mean, I think uh, you started uh, having thought of the hash. Yeah. Um, you should probably, again, you have, depending on you know, your configuration and your needs. Uh, generate cash for all data sets. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Our next talk is on uh, the new history by Sam. I agree, it's great and fantastic to see everybody. It's definitely new after two years. I uh, will talk about the Galaxy history. Sam, can you move forward a little? Oh, sorry. Is that better? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll talk about the Galaxy history, our recent developments, and um, future ideas. And before I start, I want to give an outline of the talk. So at first, 
I'll just introduce what is the history actually, what's its role within Galaxy, and then I'll talk about the new features and changes which came now with this current release and what it, that enables users to do. And then we'll see a demonstration. Um, first of all, the role of the history. So if we look at the Galaxy UI, we have three main panels. And usually one process is you start on the, on the left-hand side where all the tools are listed. You can search all the tools of your instance. You select a tool and that populates the center panel in which you can now parameterize these tools. Once you have decided on the parameters and selected maybe additional data, you can execute this tool and that will populate your history on the right hand side. And your history has with this, the main duty of it is to display data sets or data samples. That's the main duty of it. Of course, once you have displayed data sets, we also have quick links made available and they're visible, which allow you to delete data sets or otherwise edit metadata and so on. So it helps you to manage your data sets too, of course. But the main challenge is to quickly and efficiently display your samples. And then usually the process is continuous in such a way that you select samples, your tools and parameters, run them. Now you look at the results, the upcoming, uh, uh, there might be visualizations, you wanna dig deeper into it. You derive a conclusion from that. And that leads you to the next iteration of your research cycle is to produce new uh, samples and continue this cycle over and over. And the history's uh, second most important uh, role is to keep track of all the data you produce. So given that role, what we have achieved now in this release is to have much larger, significantly larger histories. And with the availability or the possibility to handle these larger histories, there comes also certain requirements. And these are the additional features. We had need rapid filtering. Of course, you have much more data, so we need um, much faster filtering in order to be able to select data sets. And we also introduce block operations, which I will also demo briefly. Uh, these operations now can run on the entire history. So with the larger history, better filtering and operations upon all data sets. And what made the larger histories possible is a complete rewrite and new iteration of the history code. We move to a modern reactive framework, the Vue framework. And what Vue does is a client-side JavaScript framework, which allows you to bind in the data and it will react to changes in the data and display them immediately. And it gives you a nice clean structure to connect data. And for our purpose, the data, um, since it comes from the API, from the actual history uh, contents, um, we provide, we, we developed some data providers, some store data providers, which are generic. These are shown here in yellow. So now if someone has a view component and wants to utilize or show the data in the history, what that person can do is just import a provider simply just like any other view component into their component. And here the left-hand side should view that could be a single component or a whole set of components. But the main uh, feature here is that you import one of these, the generic store provider, and you specify, for example, the history item store with specifying a getter and an action for that store. And that will populate your component uh, with the data you requested, and it will also be reactive. So if the data changes, your component immediately changes too. And these generic store providers also allow you to specify props to configure and parameterize your, um, your stores or your store getters, the ones you use. So there's a lot of flexibility in one simple interface um, to reduce the complexity of the stores. Additionally, the stores are always up to date. How we achieve this is we have currently a watcher, which for the current history will uh, detect changes and update all the stores. So the, the entire UI, if plugged in through this, will always have the most current data 
uh, without having to press refresh. It can also be used in other embedded components. It doesn't have to be just the, the history panel because we also embed these data samples, let's say, for example, in the invocations and in reports and other contexts, they will also be up to date. And with this, I would like to show a brief demo of the current history. And what we'll see in the beginning is a fresh relog. You can see that it goes slow, of course, but it goes very fast. What you can do now is you can scroll through thousands of data sets fairly quickly and um, display them. And additionally, you can go from top to bottom here. There's several thousand data sets uh, being scrolled through. You have the option to have these quick filter options just like before. So we didn't change much on the UI to keep it the transition also simple uh, and intuitive that the learning purpose uh, is low. You can see now when you delete data sets, they disappear immediately. You don't have to press refresh for the UI to update. Additionally, we introduced this uh, filtering panel to assist in identifying the keywords you want to search for. Technically, you could enter all the keywords just in the search field like done here. So you see we selected history data sets with the ID below 1000 and with the extension PDB. But you don't have to remember all the keywords because you can just click on the double arrows and uh, populate the form, press search, and then you'll, you'll get the keywords um, displayed to you. Additionally, this comes with benefits for other um, features which use the history. For example, here, the collection builder, um, which is also now much faster because you can also see it start populating it in the back because they are independent. So the co collection builder just communicates with the API and does what it wants to do. It doesn't have to worry uh, about what the history does because the history will always be up to date um, due to the watcher and the connectivity. You will see some basic features, changing the name, uh, adding tags. So that's uh, remained consistent. And the storage dashboard, which then we <coughs> talked about, uh, appeared here in the central panel. Okay, I wanna highlight the feature which I mentioned, but which was not shown in the, in the video. In the screencast, it's a bulk operations. And what we've done here, it's very similar from the at first sight uh, as how it worked before. Uh, we just improved the UI a little bit on at first sight, but there are additional uh, major changes here. So first, just it, it didn't change in that way that click on the checkbox on the left upper side and you get this uh, check options. You can select your data sets. And then if you click on the highlighted drop down button, it will indicate how many data sets you have and how many you have selected. And as I said, you can now for the first time select all data sets in the history. So that's a major change. Not only the visible set like it was in the versions before. And additionally, you also have uh, new block operations. For example, to change data sets, uh, to change the database build, add tags for all data sets at once, or remove them or delete, all these operations can be applied. Uh, completely, and here we see a brief demo on just quickly selecting all in your items in your history and changing the data set uh, builds. And you see there a question mark first, and then the operation will uh, proceed through the API, and you have your new uh, assigned database builds here. Another very important feature which we introduced in a very uh, in the least intrusive way, I would say, but it's an important feature, is that now for the first time, given this new architecture, it's no problem at all to start connecting the data set samples in the history with each other to bring them into context. And we demonstrate this here by highlighting the inputs for a given data set. So here's data set number 11, and you can see that the, with the additional option, that the uh, three other data sets, which are highlighted here with the blue arrow, uh, are connected in the sense that they are the same inputs for the same tool. So here we have the option to, in a meaningful way, add more features depending on the metadata, which is available. So one thing, of course, would be the outputs, inputs and outputs, maybe also additional collapsing 
uh, in order to include the highlighting. But overall, there is no limit to um, enriching the history with this inter interconnected data. This demonstrates it really well. Um, like to also show other slightly uh, developments which were in the slight periphery of it. She also saw a really nice how uh, John also demonstrated the usage of this. We upgraded our uh, tours and our tours now are entirely geofied and they can run on the new history. They are very robust and um, they help of course to uh, demonstrate new features as we've seen and uh, have also test I think. Um, because these uh, tours are implemented in such a way that our testing framework automatically runs on. So there, there are multiple, multiple levels of benefits here. So what is next? Pretty conservatively, since we had huge uh, changes this time, um, my favorite uh, three items are increase the test coverage for the next release, remove some of the legacy code, of course, there's still some legacy code, because in this transition, you're still able to switch between the two histories just as a safety plan. Um, but that, um, I don't think anyone has used it. There shouldn't be any missing features or anything. Uh, and then we find the processes. And uh, we have, of course, other ideas coming up and I encourage everyone to join this conversation. It's on GitHub. It's uh, also in an additional document. And this is kind of an example on how these ideas are communicated. For example, uh, the suggestion is here, can we have scrollers which help us even further to navigate our history by, let's say, going in a certain region of certain dates or just uh, highlighting certain tools. And um, the technology provide, makes, enables us to do these things. We just have to decide what do we want to do, what's the most useful for the users, and there should be an open discussion. And with this, I want to really thank the entire community. Um, this is a continuous community effort by far over several years, very different projects from just an entire modernization of Galaxy itself, which made this possible. And a special thanks definitely to the, to the UI group, to the backend group testing and systems, which made this transition very efficiently possible. They worked excellently together and, and brought everything together. Um, and I wanna highlight some uh, significant contributors here too. Uh, David, who did not only the storage dashboard as we saw, but also the bulk operations was extremely helpful with the API support. Uh, Marius helped a lot with the data strategy. So the data strategy design, the UX stores, um, they're from there, they're from his uh, writing pretty much. And of course also Ahmed and Asunta, new features and refinements. And with this, I want to thank everybody for their contributions. This really is a sum of everybody's work. Thank you so much. Um, is there any plan to introduce a way of, for example, connecting individual history items in some form of hierarchy that is sort of like below, so intermediate between history and the user? Can you also, the question is, can we, so we have the history and it's listed. Yeah. And your question is to have an additional, a subset of the history or? No, like, is it, like, would it be somehow possible to like group multiple histories sort of together under something that, because like, a I see. has okay. all histories, but like some of those histories might be related. Yeah. They might be different mm -hmm. runs on like the okay, same sort of initial data and so on. Yeah, so the question is, can we group histories uh, with each other, several histories and subsets of histories. And I think this is a great idea. Um, I think it fits into the context of the multi-view history where we have that, um, which we also start uh, transitioning and will be in the, in the next release. And in that context, we should see if it makes sense. I mean, currently you can tag histories, right? That's, that's kind of an option to do that. It might make sense to look further into it maybe to um, be able to search and highlight. You can actually search tagged history. So I guess if that's enough that would be already covered there. Thank you again. And our last talk.
for this session is on uh, is by Keith Suderman on automated benchmarking. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Suderman. I'm part of the Galaxy team at uh, Johns Hopkins, and I'm going to uh, introduce a tool that we developed uh, to automate bench uh, benchmarking in uh, Galaxy. Um, this was motivated as part of our work, uh, the Anvil project, uh, cost modeling project. Um, the goal is to collect some real world data, um, running real world workflows um, to get an idea of the costs involved. Um, and we quickly realized that running these benchmarks manually was not going to be, be an option. Um, so what we needed to do is we want to make sure we're running the same workflows um, on the same data with the same configuration to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. Um, Amazon and Google, they have hundreds of different instance types, um, uh, compute optimized or memory optimized when we start throwing in uh, the number of CPUs um, or the amount of memory. Um, the sheer number of uh, possibilities uh, makes the search pace um, intractable. Uh, so we developed ABM, uh, which is simply a, a Python command line tool uh, that wraps common uh, Galaxy APIs such as uh, BioBlend, uh, Planemo. Um, also, since uh, Anvil runs on Kubernetes, it can also interact with uh, Cube Control and Helm. Um, so we can reconfigure the Galaxy instance, uh, run a benchmark, reconfigure the Galaxy instance again, um, run another uh, benchmark. Uh, and then we can uh, pull um, the runtime information out of Galaxy to see how um, things actually work. Um, so what is, uh, when I'm talking about a benchmark here, um, I'm actually talking about a, a relatively specific thing. Um, our benchmarking experiments uh, consist of three components, the actual artifacts that we're using, that is uh, the workflows and the data sets. Um, a benchmark, air quotes, um, is a, a given workflow on a, a given data set. Um, and then an experiment is running uh, a benchmark on a given cluster with specific uh, parameters. Um, so when we're running a, a benchmark, uh, running a benchmark in a single galaxy instance is relatively easy and straightforward. That's not difficult to do. But when we start running it on multiple um, galaxy instances, we run into a problem in that in the GA files and uh, whatnot, um, Galaxy refers to uh, uh, custom ID values uh, to identify uh, both the workflows and the data sets. Those ID values are generated with a secret key that should be unique on every Galaxy instance, which means the ID values are uh, unique across Galaxy instances. So that uh, adds a little bit of a twist um, to running our Galaxy workflows. Um, fortunately, BioBlend does allow us to look up an ID value given a, uh, a name and also look up a name given the ID value. So that's what I, uh, ABM does to find uh, workflows and uh, data sets. And we have a method in there to translate, given a, a set of ID values, uh, we can translate those uh, into names and then also validate that workflow on another uh, Galaxy instance to make sure that you know 20 hours into the run, it's not gonna complain because it can't find something. Um, so how would a user um, use ABM. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, convention over configuration. Uh, so ABM itself requires very little setup. Um, you're going to need to write a, a profile uh, file that uh, just defines the URLs of the Galaxy instances we want to use and your API key um, for those uh, Galaxy instance. Um, there's also a way that you can specify um, locations of data sets uh, so they can be loaded from uh, S3 buckets or from Zenodo or any place that has a, um, a URL and that we can use them. Uh, once we have our uh, configuration in place, um, we can upload our workflows, we can upload our data sets, um, and then we write a, a simple YAML configuration file. 
uh, that defines how many times we want to run our benchmark, uh, the benchmark configuration that we're going to use, and then the Galaxy instances where we want to um, run things. Um, so here's a, an example of a, a simple benchmark, um, the output history name, uh, the number, uh, the benchmark to run, uh, the input data sets uh, that it requires, um, and then the, the, the name of the, the workflow. Um, once Galaxy uh, has been running, we can also inspect the jobs uh, to make sure they haven't errored out. Um, we can get the information from the job, and then we can also dump all the uh, uh, runtime statistics, uh, CPU usage, memory usage, and whatnot, out to a CDS file so we can load that into either a spreadsheet um, or a database um, for further analysis. Here's a quick analysis, just some uh, runtime in seconds that we've done on some various tools. Uh, there's HiSat, Bowtie 2 on the left, and BWA, BWA Mem on the right. Um, so we can see as we add CPUs, our runtime goes down relatively linearly. Uh, eight CPUs seems to be about the sweet point. Uh, memory doesn't have the same effect, though. Uh, there is a point of diminishing returns adding memory where adding memory doesn't do anything except uh, increase the cost. Um, there's a little graph there that shows our runtimes and our costs. Uh, it turns out, uh, uh, long story short, uh, cost um, CPU uh, optimized or compute optimized instances give you both the best bang for the buck. I'll be doing a, a demo tomorrow if you want to come and see it in action. And I think we've got a few moments for questions. Thank you. Uh, what would you like to do once you have all this data? Um, the goal uh, for that, as I said, it was part of the Anvil cost modeling project. Um, so when people are configuring instances, they make up numbers on how many CPUs they need or how much memory they need. Uh, the idea is, is to provide a, a dashboard for users that they can say, oh, I want to run this tool on this many terabytes of data. Uh, what kind of instance is best for me and how much approximately is it going to cost? That's sort of where we're going or would like to go. Okay, we're right out of time. Thank you. Yeah.